And somebody goes, what's that gonna cost? They go, a billion dollars, with a B, in 1965. There was a time, believe it or not, where Chrysler made huge advances in actually trying to build a turbine car for the public, a turbine-powered car. Now, some people have heard of this, but most people don't know the extent that Chrysler went in this project. And that's the startling thing, because back in the 1950s, a guy came to Chrysler, an engineer, who said, you know something, they're making great strides in turbine technology, and, and there were turbine aircraft, there were fighter craft, powered by turbines during World War II on all sides. Germans had them, the, English, the British had them, and Americans were building them shortly thereafter. So turbine-powered aircraft were becoming very well known. And somebody said, why don't we put one in a car? And so Chrysler said, you know something, we've always experimented with different things. Sure, knock yourself out. So they set up a little turbine division in Highland Park. Consider putting a turbine engine in a car. So they got to work and they actually built a turbine engine that was fairly small compared to what you'd see in like say an airplane. And it was an automotive turbine, so it had to have some different things done. It had to be a better casing, for instance, in case one of the blades separated, as they say, at high speed. And so they actually built a turbine engine that they could connect up with a transmission and power a car with, and they dropped it into a car in 1953. Most people know that Chrysler was building turbine cars in the 60s, but they put one on the road in 1953. The guy in charge of the program was a guy named George Hubner. George Hubner was a, uh, an engineer, but a very, very flashy engineer. I jokingly tell people that he was an extroverted engineer, which is something that doesn't exist very much in nature. And he loved publicity. So he would actually call up the press and go, hey guys, I got a jet powered car, you wanna see it? And a whole swarm of reporters would show up. He'd demonstrate the turbine powered car. So he realized people love this stuff because cars, after the war was over, you know, the, people were buying cars, but there hadn't been any major changes in automotive technology that were this kind of seismic changes. So the idea that there'd be a jet-powered, a turbine-powered car would really cause people to go, really? That's crazy. And the interesting thing about a, a, a turbine engine in a car is they sound like a turbine engine in an aircraft. George Hubner realized people love this idea. But the cool thing about turbine engines is they have fewer moving parts than a piston engine. They don't reciprocate, they spin. So they run smoother. Fewer moving parts, they run smoother. And oh, by the way, they'll run on anything that burns. So they would do demonstrations where they'd run it on alcohol, kerosene, home heating oil, VO5 hairspray, tequila, peanut oil, vegetable. They, they would do these demonstrations and show it's multi-fuel. The weird part is that in the 50s and 60s, nobody cared. Gasoline was cheap. It's like saying I have an alternative to water. You go, it comes out of the wall and I turn the faucet. I don't need an alternative to water. Gasoline was the same thing back then. So nobody really cared about the multi-fuel aspect of it right away. So Chrysler has the turbine car. George Hubner's promoting it. He's hoping that if he can get enough people in the public to want the car, he can convince Chrysler to start building the cars and selling the cars. There's a major problem though because turbine engines are very, very picky in their, you know, how they're made up. They need to have, you know, exotic metals, very, very precision parts. So there is something that they have to work out with this, with the technology, but it's doable. So they get the first car on the road. It seems to be running fine. Upgrade the engine. They eventually had a seventh generation engine. So seven generations as they improved, improved, improved along the way. So second or third one they build, George Hubner announces, just so you guys understand how serious we are at Chrysler about building turbine engines, we're gonna actually drive one cross country. So they brought a turbine powered car to New York City, had a thing on the side, cross country turbine trip. George Hubner's in the front seat, holds a press conference to everybody and they drive it cross country. Everywhere they go, they're doing interviews, TV, radio, newspapers show up. It's a huge publicity event that's unbelievable. People are clamoring for turbine-powered cars. The weird thing is that Chrysler's hinting they're going to build them, but they've never talked about how expensive they're going to be or anything like that. But it's something that George Hubner's convinced will happen if he gets enough ground support for this. So somewhere along the line, early 1960s, he gets permission to build a fleet of turbine-powered cars. They actually engage Ghia in Italy to build the cars. Uh, Elwood Engel, 
who recently come from Ford to Chrysler, designs the cars. And he designs a car that's specifically going to be nothing but a turbine car. Up until this point, they dropped the turbine engines in other cars they built. Now they've got a specific purpose-built car that's going to be a turbine-powered car. And they call it the turbine car. So they build 55 of these cars in Italy. They ship them over here. They bring them to a plant in Detroit where they tear them apart. They put the powertrains in them, reassemble them. And they announce that if you want to drive a turbine car for two months, contact Chrysler and we're going to draw the names of various people at random and you might get to drive a turbine car for a couple months as just part of this huge project. They got so much attention, mountains of postcards being sent in. It got all this attention and they started doing this. They started delivering cars to people. So they'd call you up and say, hey, congratulations, you get a turbine car for two months. And they'd come to your house and oh, by the way, we're going to call the press. They're going to be there too. Hold a press conference in your front yard of us handing the keys over, demonstration, maybe let the journalists take it for a drive. But for two months, you get to drive it. All you got to do is put fuel in it. If it breaks down, give us a call. But other than that, just drive it around. I interviewed people who got those cars. They said for two months, they were rock stars. Everywhere they went, people would look because it sounds, it, it sounds like a low-flying airplane. You look and the car is distinctive looking. 54 of the cars were painted turbine bronze. It's a really cool looking car, really cool sounding car. I spoke to people who said they would go to the store to buy like a loaf of bread and come out and be a crowd of people around the car. They have to show them the car, fire the car up, take people for drives, drive it around. I know people who said they got so sick of it, they hid the car. They come home from work, put it in the garage, close the door. A guy told me he forgot to close the garage door and he looked outside and there was a school bus stopped and all the kids were coming up to look at his car. So they got all this publicity for a couple of years. People were going insane. They wanted to buy these cars. Chrysler was getting people contacting saying, I don't care what the price is. I want to buy one. Here's a check, sending them down payments. I want one of these cars. Well, here's the thing. They knew how much it cost to build the cars. They're built in Italy, but they could build cars in America much cheaper. So the car cost is not that bad. The car actually had a torque flight transmission in it, which is what Chrysler was using at the time. So they had off the shelf technology for that. What really mattered though was the cost of the engine and they had done a lot of work through the first four generations of the turbine engine this is the fourth generation turbine engine in the Ghia. they for instance inside a turbine have a bunch of fan discs which have fan blades on them and if you look in the front end of an airplane's jet engine you'll see the fan blades well the fan blades have to be really really perfectly balanced and so on to make sure the thing spins properly chrysler had actually developed the technology where they could cast those they could cast a disc as a single casting. So it was going to save them a ton of money. But they did not have any infrastructure in place to start manufacturing turbine engines. So somebody actually said, you know, you got to build a factory from the ground up just to build these engines. And somebody goes, what's that going to cost? They go, a billion dollars with a B in 1965. <laughs> and so they go, um, that's not going to work. So I interviewed the guy who made the call. They actually called up a guy who is a, a pricing guy in Chrysler. And they would often bring him in and say, hey, what would it cost us to, and they'd give him a hypothetical, you know, take that engine and put it in that car. What's it going to cost us if we wanted to make that car like a foot shorter, whatever, you know. And they, and they actually said, dude, it's your job. Find out what it's going to cost to mass produce turbine engines and stick them in cars. And he went and contacted all the various people. And the lowest estimate he got was $10,000 per engine. <laughs> so he went back and he said, okay, guys, here's the problem. 318, typical off-the-shelf V8, it's a couple hundred bucks. Turbine engine, 10 grand. There's no way that you can possibly sell these to the public and break even, let alone turn a profit. No one will buy them that expensive. So they kind of buried those numbers and those stories in the press, and they just said, well, we're still working on it. We're still working on it. And the weird thing that happens, though, right around this time is that the federal government starts clamping down on tailpipe emissions. And the turbine engine, which will burn on anything, it'll burn anything, gasoline, kerosene, diesel, doesn't matter. The tailpipe emissions were something they never worried about. But they started clamping down on things like NOx emissions. And it turns out that that's one of the things that the turbine engine doesn't do real well with. And many companies, for instance, started going with catalytic converters to solve this problem. And there was almost no way for them to go back and re-engineer the turbine engine to be as good as it was, along with the tailpipe emissions that they never saw coming. Plus... Chrysler had its first financial troubles shortly thereafter, the first time they almost went bankrupt. So Chrysler downsized their turbine program. They called back in the 55 cars that they had out there. Many people saw those cars. For instance, they had the car at the World's Fair 
uh, and they gave people rides in the World's Fair. The car was all over the news, Time Magazine, New York Times, everybody had stories about the Chrysler, amazing Chrysler jet car, turbine car, whatever they called it. They continued building upgraded versions, fifth version, sixth version, and they actually built their last turbine car in 1983. And they had this turbine powered car that ran just fine. But the problem they had with it is they could never get the cost of the engine itself down to a point where it made sense. And so if you were thinking about buying a car and somebody said, okay, you can buy a piston engine to car over here or put a turbine engine you know, for $10,000 upgrade, who's gonna take that? And, and, and interestingly enough, it wasn't until the very end of the program where somebody said, oh, by the way, it's multi-fuel. What? You know, and, and, and so there's, there's photographs later where they actually show the car hooked up to a display that's got all these different fuels on it that, that it can burn, but nobody worried about that previously. So the program wound up getting mothballed. Uh, in all, Chrysler built 77 or 78 turbine cars total. The bronze car, the, the turbine, that actually says turbine on it, they built 55 of those. 54 of them were bronze, one of them was white. The cars were built in Italy. They're being imported into America. At that time, they had a choice to make when you import something from Italy. You had to either say, we're gonna pay full import duties on it, or we're gonna bond them and guarantee that we either ship them back out of the country or we destroy them. So Chrysler, when they brought over the 55 cars from Italy, had a choice to make. Are we gonna to wanna to keep all 55 of these? And if so, we have to pay. So they actually only paid to keep about 10 of them. The other 46 were crushed and burned at a scrapyard in Romulus, Michigan. And I interviewed a guy who was there and he said, you've never seen more grown men cry, literally crying, because they designed this car. It was hand built in Italy by Ghia. And these things were works of art and they had this space age power plant. Now they pulled the motors out of them because the motors weren't imported. So you can keep the turbines out, but they destroyed the cars. Of the nine cars that remained, they actually offered them to museums. Said, if you want one, you can have one. So for instance, the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles has got one. The St. Louis Museum of Transportation has got one. The Smithsonian has got one. Two of them found their way into private hands. Jay Leno has got one. And there's a private collector in Indiana who's got one because one of the cars got sold to a museum. The museum sold it at an auction. Tom Monahan, the pizza guy, bought it. He sold it. And then later on, that guy got it. The sad part is that some of the cars that are out there don't run. So there's one at the Detroit Historical Museum that doesn't run. It was sent there with uh, just the casing for the engine, but the internals are missing. Jay Leno's runs. And in fact, I've had the opportunity to drive it, which is very nice of him to let, let me do that. And it's really, really cool. Went out to his place in California. Uh, we went for drive. He drove first, and then we switched. <laughs> Want to drive my car? Sure. <laughs> Driving around. And the cool thing is I've owned a Chrysler product from that era. I owned a 69 Dodge Charger when I was in high school. I know how the steering felt. I know how the transmission felt. This car ran just like that. It felt just like that, but it sounded different. We're driving down the street in Burbank and people's heads are snapping around. It sounds like there's a low flying airplane coming in, a jet coming in, but it's not loud. It's not like it's so loud that it'll blow your mind, but it's, it's the, the, the whistling, whooshing sound. People, it sounds like a big vacuum cleaner, right? And so it's one of those things where it was so unusual, but so cool. Uh, the tachometer goes to 60,000 RPM. Red line is 60. The temperature gauge goes up into the thousands because it's not measuring coolant temperature. It's measuring the temperature at the ignition point in the combustion chamber. You know, that's what you measure on a jet apparently. So there's so much cool technology that goes into this. But right now, Chrysler still has two of them. I've actually gotten to drive one of those as well. Uh, and the interesting thing is that all these bronze turbine cars, they're all identical, including the same key will start each and every one of them. And the reason I know that is that I interviewed the guy who delivered the cars to the v different people who used the cars. That program, by the way, where they lent the car out, 203 different families had the car. They put over a million miles cumulatively on those cars with almost no problems. It proved that the situ you know, they, they were viable. They're expensive, but they were viable. But Bill Carey, the guy I interviewed, uh, who's in the cover of my book, by the way, uh, Bill Carey told me, he goes, yeah, he goes, one key would start them all. He goes, otherwise it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> Trying to remember which key was, goes what. Because ever have a fleet of cars? They all look alike. You can't say this one goes to the bronze turbine. They're all bronze, you know? So it was a fascinating concept. It was a fascinating project. And like I said, most people have heard maybe about the turbine car in the middle. 
But they started in 53 and ran through 83. And they built 77 turbine cars. But the primary one is the bronze one in the middle. They had a you know, fleet of cars that they lent to the public. And Chrysler didn't spend a penny, for the most part, on advertising those cars. And they got millions and millions of dollars of free publicity because the turbine car project in the middle was basically a gigantic publicity stunt.